Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Amen. Carissimi, beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast Mass on this, as we said, the Feast of St. John Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, Patriarch of Constantinople, born in the year 349 AD in the great city of Antioch, where first we were called Christians. That see, of course, founded by uh, Paul and Peter. Born to uh, a noble family, uh, unfortunately, regrettably, his father died when he was very young, but brought up by his mother and then uh, sent to study um, oratory uh, under the great Libanius, uh, who was famed as a master uh, rhetorician and, uh, or, and orator. But uh, even though uh, he was already recognised uh, for his scholarship, and indeed for his erudition, at the age of 20, after his baptism, he retired out of the world to seek the solitude of a monastic existence as a hermit, uh, forsaking uh, his inheritance, perhaps much rather, uh, perhaps like St Anthony of Egypt and St Paul of Thebes, who we recently commemorated. They too, remember, had a great inheritance and gave it all up, remembering St Matthew chapter 19, and uh, the story of the rich young man and our Lord telling him to give up all that he possesses for the sake of the kingdom of God. So uh, he there uh, for 13 years uh, lives a monastic existence. Now whether he was uh, compelled by this spirit or as some others suggest perhaps he had become ill, he returned to Antioch and there was prevailed upon by the bishop recognising his faith and his piety uh, to be ordained. He reluctantly succumbed to being ordained deacon at the age of 31 and later at the age of 36, uh, finally condescend, not condescend, finally uh, uh, agreed uh, to be ordained priest. Uh, he was a f famous preacher, indeed he was uh, appointed uh, preacher of the great church in Antioch and uh, their crowds flocked uh, to him to hear uh, his eloquent uh, preaching. He was also too famed for his charity and his pastoral zeal. Then came a time when uh, the Emperor Theodosius uh, exacted a great tax and the people of various great cities uh, responded, as people do, rather negatively to the raising of these taxes. And so, uh, and gradually a uh, very a great civil unrest broke out, uh, but uh, cons uh, uh, St John uh, uh, became employed uh, for his uh, erudition to then placate uh, the people of the city of Antioch, uh, which he did most eloquently and calmed uh, everything down. This then brought him to the attention of the emperor uh, and to the wider church. And again, his fame for his preaching began to spread. So it was that aged 49 in 397 AD, he suddenly was elected uh, Patriarch or Archbishop of Can Constantinople. Uh, much to his chagrin, indeed, he was very reluctant uh, to accept the position. He declined it, uh, but via a ruse, uh, ended up being taken to Constantinople uh, and, and almost consecrated and enthroned against his will. Indeed, rather, he had to resign himself to accepting and to recognising that this must be God's will. However, there was uh, another great bishop, the Patriarch of Alexandria, uh, Theophilus, who had had his eye on the great prize of the See of Constantinople, uh, being as it was the sea, the Imperial See, uh, and a position of great influence and power. Uh, and he indeed uh, was invited and enthroned uh, John uh, upon the throne. But this, however, did not uh, uh, bend his, his pride to God's will. Rather, he then sought uh, to uh, uh, undermine uh, St. John. 
and there were others too who were more than happy to do so. For St John came with a, reform a reformative zeal uh, to Constantinople. He was uh, shocked and appalled uh, to find uh, that uh, the royal court itself, of course, lived in great decadence, but also with great debauchery, that uh, the clergy uh, were appalling in all sorts of ways, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, simony uh, was, was prevalent everywhere, people were being ordained for money, uh, were celebrating sacraments for money, the uh, uh, vocations of the priests were more about money than they were about serving God. Uh, indeed, of course, we might remember that we're almost a century now into the uh, recognition and establishment uh, of the church uh, as a, a, a state religion after Constantine the Great. Uh, and so uh, positions within the church, rather like they had done previously in the uh, civil service, as it were, of the empire, uh, became positions sought after because of their influence and political power, uh, and obviously money, uh, became positions sought after by young noble people, etc., who then, of course, were corrupting, as it were, uh, the priesthood coming with worldly cares and thoughts and concerns rather than with a deep desire to serve God. All of this then St John started to address and this of course one can imagine did not go down too well. At the same time prevalent everywhere was the heresy of still of Arianism despite the Council of Nicaea in 325 and despite the wonderful um, uh, uh, so the wonderful defense uh, of orthodoxy that others like Ambrose and Basil uh, have made and Athanasius, uh, even so, Arianism abounded indeed, uh, had infected the royal court and had reached even the empress uh, Eudoxia. She then, of course, not happy with uh, uh, St. John's uh, pietistic zeal uh, and uh, disagreeing with him over the very nature of Christ, then sought to use all her wiles and uh, cooperated with uh, Theophilus uh, to unseat St. John from the throne of the sea. This uh, they were successful in doing uh, by uh, a succession of uh, terrible lies. Uh, they defamed his character in all sorts of ways, uh, accused him of blasphemies, accused him of simony, uh, accused him of having affairs, all sorts of things. Uh, they just trashed uh, his character. And unfortunately, uh, Theodosius being weak, uh, and uh, being weak especially when it came to pleasing uh, the Empress, uh, banished and sent into exile St. John. This occurred in 403 AD. Well, then the city and the sea went uh, absolutely berserk. Uh, again, riots broke out everywhere, there was great unrest. The faithful uh, and the people of the citizens of the city uh, were pro uh, St. John because they, they recognised his reformative zeal, they recognised uh, uh, his holiness of life, they knew that all these things were lies and they just would not have it. Uh, and though they tried um, to, Eudoxia and her uh, uh, companions tried to impose a new bishop, uh, the uh, faithful just would not have it. And so eventually after a year, Eudoxia recognised that it just wasn't going to happen, it wasn't working, and just for the sake of bringing peace and order, uh, uh, the sentence of exile uh, was commuted, and so St John was brought back to Constantinople. However, this was not to last barely a year, itself because when St John came back Eudoxia in his first exile had erected a great statue of herself and not placed it uh, uh, sort of conspicuously in the town square but rather had put it right outside the cathedral. This of course incensed the patriarch uh, who uh, railed against it uh, in homilies and again condemned uh, the pride and vanity uh, of uh, the worldly royal court. Uh, again, this time, of course, uh, necessitating another period of exile. So he was sentenced again by Theodosius uh, 
uh, to exile, but to a wandering exile. This time he was accompanied by soldiers and was uh, frog-marched, literally, uh, uh, around uh, the, uh, uh, the, the land, uh, forbidden uh, to uh, take any rest uh, except overnight, uh, forbidden all kind, or forbidden all, any any say, any kind of um, comfort whatsoever. Given only the scraps uh, of food to eat and made to bear, uh, walk barefoot everywhere and in all weather. Indeed, uh, the sentence of uh, exile made it clear to the soldiers uh, that he was not to be afforded any kind uh, of comfort or consolation at all. For three years he endured uh, this form of exile um, and uh, enduring sleet, snow, wind, rain, extreme heat. Uh, if you've ever been to Turkey um, uh, you'll know what an incredible uh, terrain uh, it is and how one minute it is um, beautiful pastures and greenery, the next minute it is snowy capped mountains, uh, the next minute it is great plains. Uh, you, you, Turkey encapsulates uh, uh, sort of every sort of possible conceivable kind of terrain known to man. All of that for three years uh, he was frog marched through until eventually coming to a church dedica dedicated to the uh, uh, martyr uh, Basilicus uh, whom he had known, uh, he then in a dream uh, received a vision from uh, St. Basilius uh, and uh, St. Basilius said to him, do not fear any more, brother, for you will be with me soon in paradise. And indeed, uh, lying before uh, the high altar in that church, uh, he passed away on Holy Cross Day on the 14th of September. Today's date, the 27th of January, marks the translation of his relics back to Constantinople. And indeed, there's an interesting little anecdote about Eudoxia's uh, own remains uh, that she had uh, expired, uh, but that her mortal remains would not be still. Uh, they kept rattling around in the coffin, and it wasn't until her children insisted on the relics, the remains of St John Chrysostom being returned to Constantinople and placed by her coffin side, that the rattling ceased. And another beautiful anecdote uh, is about a bishop uh, who managed uh, to um, sweet talk uh, the soldiers uh, during, his, during John's uh, frog marched exile uh, into permitting him to teach a while uh, and obviously then to sit uh, remember uh, a homily this week, uh, or I think maybe it was last Sunday, um, in the East it is the custom that great teachers sit uh, to teach. Uh, so this bishop, um, I think it's Adelphius or Adelphius, um, managed to persuade uh, the guards to relax a little for St John to teach. And of course he was amazed at St John's teaching. When you consider, and we still have a great majority of his works to this day, uh, something like 1,400 homilies, uh, uh, a, a number, great number of books um, on uh, all aspects of, of Christian life, uh, written as much for the laity, for the religious, for nuns, uh, for priests, um, uh, commentaries uh, on the uh, scriptures, um, which are just a, a, a joy to read uh, and uh, uh, containing great uh, scholarship and great wisdom, great learning, great insight. All of this then was imparted by St John in this teaching session. So after uh, his death, uh, this bishop records that he himself was granted a vision of heaven. And in heaven he saw all the great teachers uh, of the church, except St John. So it was that he asked the angel and said, how is it uh, that uh, I can see all the great scholars and teachers here of the church, all the great theologians, but I cannot see St. John? To which the angel replied, ah, uh, you can't see St. John. No one will see St. John because he is with the seraphim and the cherubim and the cherubim 
before the high throne of God. Chrysostom, of course, itself means golden-mouthed or golden-tongued, uh, again, referring to the uh, infamy of his uh, eloquence uh, and erudition. Now, it's rather beautiful that today's feast falls, as it does on this third Sunday after Epiphany, when we are reminded by Holy Mother Church, A, we are exalted in the Epistle by St Paul for this Sunday, uh, to ourselves continue to uh, mag uh, um, manifest uh, God's love in our lives, to draw others uh, to God via our own acts of charity, by ourselves manifesting uh, divine love, but also to, of course, the gospel of the centurion, uh, well, first of the leper and then of the centurion, reminding us that God, that Christ's divinity was revealed in the performance of his miracles. And we've received today the wonderful account of that great testimony of faith given by the centurion, um, to which, of course, has been uh, uh, included in the Mass uh, at the moment before we receive Holy Communion. Domine non sum dignus, the words of the centurion, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only. Such faith, Jesus says, I have not seen in all of Israel. Such faith, we might say, as extolled and exemplified by St. John Chrysostom. Such faith, uh, despite all manner of trials and hardships. Such faith which we, my brothers and sisters, are called to manifest ourselves. We who are called ourselves to manifest the divinity of Christ by the way in which we ourselves live our lives. Just as St John manifested the divine revelation in his life, so too, my brothers and sisters, should we, by living God's law, by living Christ's teaching, by making ourselves worthy to bear the name of Christ, just as those first were called Christians in Antioch 2,000 years ago. Let us then, my brothers and sisters, take inspiration from the golden mouth, take inspiration from the wonderful life of St John, exemplifying for us as it does great faith. Let us take to heart the gospel message and the example of the centurion. And let us ourselves, like St John and all the saints, place our trust in God, manifest our faith in his divinity, in his divine will, and his divine um, uh, control over all things. Let us surrender ourselves to his will, to his love, and apply ourselves to his purpose. For each and every one of us is here today because God has willed it, and God has a plan for each and every one of us to fulfill his will and manifest his love and bring others, as St John did, Though we might not all be blessed or so blessed with uh, 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 oratory skills, nonetheless we are all charged and may be blessed if only we would seek to cooperate with God's grace to manifest his love in our lives and bring, draw others to himself, who is God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>